Thanks for joining us back. We, uh, I'm Stuart Bowling, Director of uh, Content Creative Relations for Dolby. Um, and uh, please uh, give a warm welcome to uh, James Klein from Lucasfilm. <laughs> James actually has a very interesting background. Um, he studied fine art at UC Santa Barbara, uh, where he focused on oil painting and photography. Apparently, he surfed as often as possible, so that's, that's, that's always cool, too. A little too much surfing. <laughs> you can never have enough. Um, he was inspired by uh, master painters and the power of light through a lens. Uh, he then went on to the Art Center, where he studied automotive industrial art and introduction. <laughs> Uh, to design. He graduated with honors with a Bachelor of Science. Since then, James has collaborated on well over 30 film projects. Highlights include working with Steven Spielberg uh, on a different, um, uh, different pro projects and capacities from um, AI and Minority Report, very stylized uh, movies for sure. Um, and James then ended up at uh, Lucasfilm back in 2013? Uh, 2013, yeah. 2013, yeah. And you are uh, the design supervisor for Lucasfilm. I, I am, yes. Um, and put in charge of the Star Wars saga from 2013 onwards. Uh, amongst a few of us, yes. But um, in particular, uh, Force Awakens, um, The Last Jedi, and, and now uh, Rise of Skywalker. I'd like to point out first something that uh, Matthew Wood pointed out right before going on stage, which is somehow I'm wearing the George Lucas approved um, <laughs> shirt. I had no idea, honestly. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> Thank you. but uh, It's a brand. We just made it. <laughs> yeah, I almost kind of threw, threw a coat on or something just to cover it, but I was like, oh my god, I'm, I'm trying to dress like the man himself, but I thought I needed to point that out before we got into it. <laughs> That's, that is pretty funny. So um, we were actually having this chat uh, about some of your early work. Remember, uh, we were talking about Galaxy Quest, like when I was at Lucas, oh and god. I remember like sitting in on the mix of that, and then I was talking to you about it. You were like, "Oh my god, I worked on that movie." Yeah, it, it, it's good that you point that out because um, when people ask, like, "What does an art director do in film?" It's it's it, it's such a complex kind of question because we have to deal with not only kind of the the pre-production end of it, but in my case, I also deal with the post-production, the, the VFX production end of it. And uh, in the case of Galaxy Quest, it was literally one of the first projects I had worked on. And uh, I hadn't been working with ILM at the time. I was, um, I was a uh, independent contractor. And I got a call from ILM saying, we have this thing, and literally in the script it says, it's the thing of unknown origin. And, and we don't know what it is. We've tried a bunch of things. The director has no idea what he wants. Can you please come in for a week and figure this out? And um, I think that's kind of just the perfect um, analogy for, for what we're asked to do. We're asked to literally read lines on a script. Uh, like in the, in the case of Minority Report, it said uh, futuristic Washington, D.C. with some kind of futuristic buildings in the background. And, Little do we know the task at hand, which is like we're going to spend the next 18 months trying to understand that one line of, uh, of uh, script page. So um, it's a really kind of a strange uh, job, but also just wonderfully rewarding in that you just never know what you're going to be asked to do from, from day to day. Wow. So let's talk a little bit about your role then uh, at Lucasfilm. Um, so Lucasfilm decides to go back, bring another... Uh, chapter to Star Wars, actually mm. another trilogy, uh, as well as the ancillary movies. Um, what yeah, was that so, role like? So in uh, in 2013, um, I was hired two weeks before uh, Disney acquired uh, Lucasfilm, and um, I came up with no intention of working on Star Wars. I just wanted to kind of learn more about post production, and I kind of come from a, a more pre production uh, background. And um, little did I know that um, we were just brought into a room with people like Dennis Muren and um, Kathy Kennedy and Rick Carter, these like giants in the industry, and they're they're saying we're we're doing another Star Wars movie, and um, and it was kind of mind blowing because in fact the reason why I got into the industry was seeing Star Wars as a kid, and um, not knowing what how they made these movies. I was just like blown away as we all are by, by these visuals. And um, 
I found this book in the bookstore when I was a kid. It was called like the sketchbook of Star Wars. And it was literally the, the line drawings of the art director, Joe Johnston. And it was, it was these beautiful yet kind of crude line drawings that informed you know, all the filmmakers of what the movie was gonna look like. And um, I still have that sketchbook. I think I drew, in my arrogance, I kind of drew and made you know, notes and changes to stuff right. as a kid, um, but never knowing that I would actually be a part of it. Um, wow. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So when we think of Star Wars, it's obviously very stylized with the uh, with the images, the, the the worlds that we go to, the backgrounds that we're we're given, and it's also very iconic because of all the the starships that are in there, from the Falcon, Star Destroyers, etc. Um, why don't we have a little chat about the evolution of the X-wing? Yeah. So um, with Star Wars, um, there there's kind of this inherent look to it, and um, it's kind of a weird, nebulous kind of idea of like, well, what makes Star Wars Star Wars and what makes Transformers Transformers? And we have to kind of literally sit down at a table with a group of art directors and artists and try to break down, well, what does it mean to be the aesthetic of Star Wars? And uh, fortunately, we have this wonderfully rich um, history that um, George has created. Um, one of his first hires, I think I have control over this, um, was this guy, his name was Colin Cantwell. I think he was literally one of the f very first crew members to be hired by George. And his job was to kind of visualize in these model forms um, what an X-Wing looks like, what a TIE fighter looks like, what, um, what the Death Star looks like. So right. he, I think he came from um, uh, a background of working with uh, the military and developing looks for God knows whatever, but he had this great ability to kind of, there's this term called kit bashing where you can take a piece from here and a piece from there and almost in a way collage these things together. So he had this really great ability to kind of collage all these pieces together and give us a kind of a quick impression of what this is. Um, so here's an example of I think literally the first design that was proposed back to George as this, this might be an X-Wing. Um, wow. And you can see kind of the, the DNA there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's very, uh, it's kind of very hot rod, something that uh, George really um, wanted in this movie. He, he um, as, you, as you can imagine through like American Graffiti, he had this like great um, love of racing and, and uh, kind of just, legal drag racing and Modesto kind of idea. <laughs> um, and so they, the, the original artists like Ralph McQuarrie and Joe Johnson, they used imagery um, you know, from, from the 70s of like drag strip racing and, and out of that came some of this, uh, this look of this ship. Wow. I think I have something there. So that's Joe Johnston. He's actually holding Colin Cantwell's uh, models. He's kind of uh, I think he's what he's doing. He's he's kind of setting up a shot. Like if the camera was just below the X-wing, what would it look like with the uh, with the Tie Fighter in the background? I think you have an image, don't you, of a drag car in here? There we go. Yeah. So from what I from what I understand, um, George is is a big part of the the design aspect of it. it as those guys were talking about the sound itself. The design, he has, he has this really acute way of breaking down the basics of a design. So the X-Wing, the story goes that he literally drew an X for an X-Wing. He drew a circle with two lines on each side for the TIE Fighter, and he drew a circle with, with another circle inside it for the, the Death Star. Like, uh, I hope that's <laughs> true, because that's just <laughs> the most amazing ability to kind of distill down you know, this, this into its very basic shape. And yeah, raw form. Um, so you can see this is kind of a direct influence of this kind of long, elongated nose um, that gave it this kind of like look of speed and, and, and thus the, uh, the X-Wing was kind of born. So obviously with the new movies, we're set further in time. Mm. And in time, we always have the assumption as we do today that technology changes. So how did you go about changing an iconic look while retaining 
that look? Yeah, so for, for Force Awakens, um, we, um, it, it's a sequel to a sequel, essentially. It, it's a sequel to the original you know, uh, three movies. It takes place essentially like 30 years after Return of the Jedi. Um, and we were trying to, in the early days, we kind of just iterated constantly. Like, what does this mean? Is this, is this in the future too? Is everything kind of slick and, and right. really kind of futuristic? Or does it pay more homage to what has come before it with these, these original ships? And J.J. Um, Abrams, being the Star Wars fan that he is, he wanted, he wanted to capture as much of that kind of emotion from those original movies as he could. So I think that kind of informed us on the, the design of it itself. That's a Dennis Muren, a visual effects supervisor, wow. uh, who still walks the halls once in a while and imparts um, some, some great knowledge upon us. Um, but so leaping ahead to 2013, we tried to like encompass what those emotional kind of aspects of the X-Wing was, these kind of like race car uh, aesthetic. And we had started kind of like really out there and JJ kept on reeling us back and saying, no, I'm not kind of, I'm not kind of feeling it. And then, the further we actually got it back to the original, <laughs> the more he kind of reacted to, like, yeah, that's it. So, <laughs> basically, do what, what they did before. Um, we kind of came up with this idea of the wings. Obviously, the wings kind of articulate into this X shape, but we, we kind of, you can see these two wings actually nest into each other and create one wing. So those kind of little details I think JJ responded to where the, the original idea is there, but we've kind of taken some of the, the ideas and honed those ideas and made a little something more of it. Yeah, because the original had like, is it two or four engines? Yes, yeah, so Each the original had, had yeah. um, <laughs> four engines total. And um, he wanted to do something different with the engines and uh, we kept on doing six engines or eight engines. We just kept on adding more and more to it. Right. And um, when, in fact, all we did was go back to uh, the original artist, Ralph McQuarrie, and kind of looked at what he had done. And he had actually taken just two engines, but he had cut the engine in half. So when the, the wings fold out, they create two halves. So. Um, it all sounds kind of crazy that we're sitting down and a group of people are talking about this and trying to figure this out, but that, that's our job. And um, in fact, when, when he saw that, um, he, was, he, he um, automatically bought into it because he knew that it was part of the, the DNA. He knew it was part of the history of, of Star Wars. Right. Um, I show this image because... Um, you know, we we imagine the X-wing as this whole thing, this 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 bigger than life kind of ship. When in fact, when we're shooting a lot um, out in Pinewood, we're only building a very small piece of it. We're building what's called a buck, and it's on a gimbal, so we can get as much movement as we want through it. But um, those kind of filmmaking tools haven't really changed all that much. I mean they'll still still have uh, a gaffer, they'll still have somebody like on the side just shaking the thing <laughs> back and forth to, to mimic, you know, uh, them hurling through space. But um, I just, I love that this, this kind of, you know, symmetry of making films kind of the way we made them, but also using all these tools that we have to our, at our disposal now. How much changed in the cockpit? The cockpits generally stayed the same. We, um, we, we knew, we, again, we wanted to kind of shoot it in the same vein that it was right. shot back then. So we wanted the layout to kind of generally stay the way that, that they had before. Um, yeah, and you could see that kind of circle that makes up two halves that when they, the wings kind of open up, they make two half circles. How many uh, full-size X-wings did they build, do you recall? For Force Awakens, I believe they only built, they might have only built one, I could be wrong, they might have built two. So we had, 
we had the white X-wing with the blue stripes, and mm -hmm. then we had we had Poe's X-wing, which is black with some orange accents. Um, and we might we might have built two, but um, but I could be wrong. Uh, they're they're amazing to see in person, and of course you can now go to um, Disneyland or something and see them uh, kind of you know full size. But uh, working on the film and kind of being able to go out to set and see. Um, the Millennium Falcon being built was, oh. it was astounding. Um, they <laughs> yeah, they took photography, um, time elapse. You know, they had a camera and stage. Right. So somewhere exists them. You know, you can actually see the whole Falcon being built, which it took like uh, two months to build within you know time elapse within sixty seconds. And I went out there like every afternoon, like at three, and you could probably see me pop in and out just watching. <laughs> And build it, and they kind of started by hanging the uh, the cockpit first, and then they built the whole saucer piece. But um, it's amazing to see them build these because you you in your head you imagine them as these toys that you kind of right. you know ran around your room with. But to see them full size is um, yeah, it's it's really cool. It's crazy because in uh, there is like a section of the five of first in in Belgium, and they build things like this where they've made like massive. Oh kind God. of versions of these uh, of these <clears throat> iconic ships, and then they take them out to like special events. I think for the premiere of Force Awakens, they had one of these on the, uh, or maybe it was Last Jedi on the on the carpet. It was just crazy. Mm. Yeah, yeah that's for Force yeah. Awakens, I believe. Yeah. Um, and then once we get into a a design that everybody's happy with, uh, we start to get into how these vehicles interact in their environments. And um, I think JJ referenced uh, the Clint Eastwood movie Firefox, which I had to go back and watch again because um, <laughs> I don't know how many people have seen Firefox. Clint but, Eastwood, wow! <laughs> uh, it's a pretty amazing film. Um, but he had this—he wanted to do this moment where um, these ships are just flying super low and kicking up these these huge uh, rooster tails behind them of water. And um, I had done this painting initially, and it had a little bit of water kind of trickling off the back of it. And he's like, no, you know, more water. And then, and then I, I'd <laughs> add a bigger. little bit more water, and then, no, keep going with it. And it was, <laughs> with the water was practically going off the frame until he said, yeah, that, 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 that's enough. Um, but um, it's great to see also when you're <laughs> developing some of these looks that they also inform the shots themselves. So they were able to take the artwork um, which which doesn't happen that often, but they 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 were inspired by the actual shot of the artwork and kind of uh, took that and, and made a whole sequence around. Wow. It. So when you're going through having these these decisions um, with the filmmakers, then how many typically how many people are in those meetings? Were you going through doing final reviews? So when we're at when we're at this stage where we're kind of now in post production and we've got all these pieces and layers together. We, um, we're now doing um, dailies, um, probably for about two hours, an hour and a half a day. And we're looking with a group of the supervisors, probably about a dozen of us, uh, 10 of us. Wow. And then we're presenting these back to, to, to the director probably once or twice a week. And those, those, those um, as the film progresses, as we get closer, they turn into every other day kind of thing. But, um, for a shot like this, we can be looking at this shot for six months and kind of just tweaking little bits and pieces of it. And funny enough, um, just watching the, and listening to the sound guys talk, we don't hear any of this. There's no sound behind what we're looking at. We're looking at these images for, again, a couple hours a day. Um, so when we see the, the sound mix dropped into this, it's, it's almost like it's like this explosion um, wow. in your yeah. face because it it really is the other half of 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 the film process um, sometimes we would start dailies um, and our projectionist would put a little uh, YouTube like he he loves like Santana and like just music from like the 70s <laughs> and we'll go through what we're gonna go through for the day and we'll listen to just Santana <laughs> uh, for like the three minutes that it takes to go through the whole thing. 
So my context for a shot like this would be like Santana, and not <laughs> like the amazing work that Skywalker Sound puts <laughs> and into John it. John Williams, right. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, again, this is a, a, an example of the artwork kind of informing the shots that these kind of ships are dive bombing onto this thing. This is all from uh, Force Awakens, I believe. Uh, and then this is an example of, let's see if we can get this to play. <clears throat> So, cool. so we'll take, um, this is a combination of a lot of things, but it'll be if we build this full size for, for uh, shot photography, then we'll, we'll scan this whole ship, and we'll take that scan of the ship, and then we'll rebuild the ship in 3D. Um, let's see if I can play this again. And then um, we have a model maker that will build the ship again, and then we have paint that comes in, and we'll do all the, the texture mapping. And as an art director, I get to kind of oversee a little bit of that. And then we have an um, animator come in. If those wings need to articulate, if the, the cockpit door needs to open, he'll kind of add points of articulation for that as well. So it's, it, it's just like any film production, it's, um, it's a huge collaboration. You all recognize that guy? <laughs> It's not looking so hot. Sorry, it's not Baby Yoda. <laughs> it's Grandpa Yoda. Um, so this is, um, I, I want to throw a few photos in here of uh, the archives, which is a collection that George still owns of all the original props, um, uh, vehicles, costumes. He's got in this like temperature controlled space um, up in Marin County. And the wonderful thing for me is to be able to create things, but also to reference something that's come before it. A big part of our job as art directors is to kind of do a lot of reference searching, either through books or online. But in Star Wars, we get to actually go to the source and photograph, you know, the textures of um, the worm from uh, Empire Strikes Back, and this kind of informs you know, our creativity and our inspiration throughout. So on every film, I've had the chance to go up here and spend a day up here um, just going through the archives. Um, this is a fun little um, story in that these are these kind of power generators in Return of the Jedi. Uh, Han Solo and his friends seem to go in and blow up this this area that turns off the uh, the um, the shield generator, and these, if you can see at the, the bottom of it, they're actually Dixie cups that are stacked <laughs> onto each other. Uh, but you would never know that um, until, you know, somebody leaks it uh, in the office. Like, you know, we really didn't do much. We just threw some Dixie cups on it. And, yeah. But, but this, this, we try to apply that same kind of mindset to, to our designs. We right. don't want to design every little fillet and little bolt on it. We want to kind of keep it uh, fresh and, and, and do it in a way that is paying service to, to all that's come before it. Yeah, that's a little bit like R2 over here. His hollow projector is a Vickers Viscount reading light. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, there are these... Um, in the detention center in uh, A New Hope, they've got to shoot out all these like cameras. Well, those cameras are like real slide projectors that we wanted to use again in Force Awakens, so we had one of our buyers in the art department buy every single one of those on eBay <laughs> for like $2 each or something at the time. Wow. Uh, if people knew that, they'd spend thousands on it cause knowing that it was like an actual prop used in, in Star Wars. Um, so they have like all the original ships and um, as, as somebody that has access to this, we will go in and we'll photograph all the textures and all those pieces and then sometimes use that photography in um, some of the digital assets that we now build. Because we don't, unfortunately we don't build any of this stuff by hand anymore, it's all done in the computer. But right. to retain that kind of look, we want to use as much of the stuff that's come before it. Um, so we'll, we'll use that kind of uh, photography in our actual digital. It's like on the, on the greebles here of, uh, of Executor, um, <clears throat> a, lot of those, a lot of those pieces are kind of 
taken from other models um, Correct. to help create that kind of texture and look. Yeah, so back then, they, you know, they didn't have um, the ability to just 3D print whatever they wanted to. They had to kind of use off-the-shelf parts. So uh, you would go into the model shop at that time, and they would have 100 World War II tank model kits that they would pull off of. In fact, um, people try to replicate these models, and they'll find the actual... World War II tank model and use the wheel off of that and apply it to the back engine of it. But that um, whole area where there's a lot of density of detail is just battleship pieces from World War II battleships, just all stacked and layered on top of each other. And if you look closely enough to some of these, you'll find little army men that are spray painted gray that are just tucked in there. <laughs> guys must have been getting a little bored late at night or getting a little slap happy. Snuck in so you can't see it. Nice. I like to take selfies with uh, <laughs> with tontons, tontons, <laughs> medical droids. Medical droid. Um, they also do a lot of um, these little head studies for creatures before they get into fabrication of a one-to-one -one fabrication. They'll do right. little mock-ups of, uh, like you can see, Neum Nub back there. They'll do little mock-ups and they'll show, in this case, George. You know a dozen different versions of this. And sometimes he'll, for the artwork, he used to have a, stamp, a, a collection of stamps. And he would, um, if he stamped one of your drawings, you knew that very well could make it into the movie. And one of his stamps was Fabuloso. And if you knew if you got a Fabuloso next to the drawing, you knew that was going in. <laughs> um, in fact, the small window between him him signing off and selling the company to Disney right. um, and Disney's acquisition, he went around to some of our early artwork and I think I got a fab fabuloso on one of the images and I was <laughs> just like, oh my God, I can, I can die and go to heaven now. But <laughs> I, just, I love that kind of process of, uh, of what he established. Um, this is the five foot Millennium Falcon model that they shot for A New Hope. There was a, a gentleman that was trying to turn on all the lights. He was trying to wire the thing from the bottom because it hadn't been lit up in a few years. Um, but they they built a five foot model of the Falcon, and they realized that it was it was too heavy and cumbersome to put on a camera rig. Um, so they reduced it down to I think it's like a three footer that they used uh, for wow. Empire and, and Jedi. That's huge. Um, and in the case of like Solo, we, we replicated another version of the um, Millennium Falcon, and but we wanted to um, we wanted to kind of adhere to all the detail and pieces that they put in there. So we went in, kind of photographed every single little piece, and then replicated that in 3D. Wow. Uh, that's another example of one of these like early. Um, sketch models of, a, I think this was the Y-Wing, um, that looks different, but you can understand how much it, um, it kind of, you know, told you what this thing was going to eventually look like. That's um, nice. This place is amazing. I, uh, they have to kick me out at the end of the day because <laughs> every, like, <laughs> aisle upon aisle is just something new and, and wonderful. It's, it's really an amazing place. Wow. Um, so one thing we did in Rise of Skywalker is we actually took photography of some of the original map paintings. Um, the crazy thing about these map paintings is they needed a way to, to quickly paint on glass because they, it becomes an element, and that element goes um, in front of plate photography, and that's run through a whole system. Uh, and, but in order to expedite their, their workflow, they went and bought shower doors. And um, <laughs> that frame, that glass, everything is a shower door that they, Strikes it was probably again. Home Depot. <laughs> so they have just stacks and stacks of, um, and everything is the same format, same size. Uh, you know, someone's door. gonna have Star Wars themed shower doors now. <laughs> <laughs> but. For Rise of Skywalker, we went in and we actually, uh, there's a little Easter egg. We'll see who can find it first, but there are some 
map paintings from the original films of planets that we've kind of put into a couple shots. Wow, that's totally cool. Um, so the other thing I, w I wanted to talk about was kind of the, the evolution of um, the set. So a big part of my work early on is, is kind of the set design. And I spent like six months working on just hallways of uh, first order hallways. And um, Yeah, because Empire had a lot, like the Empire in general had a very unique look compared to the kind of rebels. They did, and that's kind of going back to um, the clarity that we that they wanted to establish back then, that the Empire was just this clean, black, gray surfaces, and the rebels, they didn't give a shit about their vehicles. They just kind of... <laughs> yeah, they were like the dirty, lived-in versus the yeah, kind of glossy military style. Yeah. Right. They were kind of the guerrilla warfare as opposed to the established military of the Empire. So, mm. um, again... Um, back in Force Awakens, we're like, well, what, is, what does it mean to be uh, uh, the First Order? And eventually, again, it's kind of going back to the well of like, well, what did they do and how do we kind of express what they did then and kind of elevate it or, or kind of modernize it a bit? And there was this guy, uh, Harry Lang, who was an art director on 2001 Space Odyssey. And back then with Trumbull and all those guys, um, they revered those guys that made this like real seminal movie. So they just hired them all on Star Wars. And, and Harry Lang was one of those guys that he laid out all the graphic looks of anything from the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon to um, hallways within the Death Star or control panels on the Death Star. Um, so that kind of pinstriping line, you'll see that all over Star Wars, uh, and that's kind of one guy. He was just Harry Lang, just going in there and going, I'm gonna put some lines here and some color here. So we're, we're just evoking kind of what had come before it. Uh, another aspect of the, the set design um, behind First Order and the Empire were these kind of pill lights. So you saw these, um, these, uh, these vertical, lights and whenever we just had a flat area that we had no idea what to do with we would just shove a bunch of pill lights <laughs> in it and somehow it kind of looked like what it was supposed to look like um again the color palettes they were in their kind of almost ocd way they they were very clean and simple and uh kind of brutalist and very in, in their look. Yeah. uh this would this was an example of them not having the money to build the incomplete set of this the Star Destroyer bridge, so they built the wings of the bridge um, on set left and right, but then that far background window they just painted in and just added that later and just did a locked off shot. Wow. Um, so we just we have this huge library. So yeah, you can see, I believe to the left, all those window mullions are just a painted element and everything to the right is, um, is real, right? Is real. And then they would do inserts, really close up little inserts of these coves and they would just build a little piece. Yeah, the windows were always interesting in how triangular they were. Yeah, again, it, it, out. It, it's like they created all these motifs. I don't know if they were intentionally going, we're just going to put triangles everywhere and make that the thing. <laughs> but we, we look at this and we're like, well, they, they did triangles. We should just do triangles because that's exactly what they did. So yeah. um, you'll see in Rise of Skywalker, we have a bridge and it's going to follow that same kind of motif. I mean, it it kind of sounds like lazy design, but it's it's also trying to keep this this kind of this look to Star Wars that when people see a movie, if you were to only look at it as an image, you would be able to understand that it's, that right. it's Star Wars. And then the hangars, we, we have, we have because we have ships, we need to have hangars, and I'll show you kind of a progression of the hangar for, for our films as well. Uh, we established these, these kind of big, um, striking diagonal lines because um, we're always looking for new ways to, if we have a hallway here, what's a different hallway gonna look like if we go down that corner and turn right? We would take these, these big 
um, diagonals, and we just flip them the other way. So one hallway <laughs> might do this, but if you go around the corner, you'll see that we just took all those diagonals and just flipped them that way, and you'll get another, I think, uh, yeah. So we, yeah, right. that's just us flipping it the <laughs> other way. That's so interesting. More windows. More windows. <laughs> More windows. Uh, this is an interesting, this is one of our first sets on um, Force Awakens that, that kind of got a buy off and um, we we're struggling to try to figure out what is the shape of this kind of torture room. And, um, and I had suggested this big triangular form on the, on the ceiling to replicate almost like a Star Destroyer itself. And um, I think JJ responded to not only that idea, but the idea that as you got further and further in the room, that the, the walls would start to close in and you'd start to get this more claustrophobic feel yeah, as kind of you oppressive. kind of got further and further into the space. Um, so a lot of it has to do with aesthetic and look, but you're constantly trying to understand, well, what is the, the, the emotion behind the scene? And, and um, anytime you can kind of build something around that certainly helps. So what kind of tools are you using when you're creating this? Um, well, a lot of my job is, is just kind of pointing and <laughs> pointing. scratching on <laughs> other people's work that's far better than mine. But <laughs> I, I do use um, a couple 3D tools. One of them is this Moto tool that it's just a quick kind of uh, 3D package that I can bring in other people's work and kind of reiterate on. Um, I use Photoshop. Um, right. But a lot of times, it's just me kind of taking everybody else's work and kind of pushing stuff around and, um, and keep, keeping it on track in that way. But, um, but what we can do, that what 3D allows us to do is not only design a look, <clears throat> we can take all this 3D geometry and we can, we can build real sets off of it. And then we can also take this work and build post-production as uh, digital extensions. So, it so how much? So how much information then are you providing <coughs> to the physical production when they're when they're going out to build? So like the X wing earlier, we have a full size X wing. You guys obviously have models. How much data do you provide to production so they can physically build that? It, it's quite a lot at this point. We can build um, just in early pre production. We can build that ship and hand that over to. Um, to the builders that will break that down and build that into a physical piece. But a lot of those models can now be directly dropped right into the, the physical production aspect of it. Wow. <clears throat> um, so again, you can see, um, I think this, this space started with none of those pill lights and the moment <laughs> we drop those pill lights in, uh, everybody starts to buy into it. Um, oh, consoles. Consoles. Like, who knew that there'd be so many consoles within a movie? <laughs> but um, just literally developing what is the the large, medium, small size console. And what's wonderful about these pieces is they'll build them, <clears throat> and they'll build them so they're wildable, so they can just move around a set. And they might not even be in where it's supposed to be, but a director might want to use it as like a bit of a cutting element. Like, I need a little bit of foreground here. Right. Let's just move that console over, move the guy's chair over, put him in <laughs> the foreground. Um, it has no relationship to how the layout of the set is, but they just act as little motifs when, when they're needed. So this is an example of taking that, that shot of the Falcon from um, A New Hope and us having to kind of design, well, what is the next generation of a, of a hangar? And uh, this went through a lot of iteration and we eventually kind of came across this idea, well, what if the, the TIE fighter, we called this the Pez dispenser hangar. So <laughs> like a Pez dispenser, like candy coming out of the, <laughs> the top of this, these TIE fighters would be able to kind of uh, drop down and guys would be able to get into them and, and race off. Um, but that kind of idea of these, these ships kind of being put on the wall like that informed the whole shape of the, the hangar itself. Um, 
it's weird how full circle this has become because there's a new ride at Galaxy's Edge at Disneyland where they actually built a huge section of this. So you'll be able to uh, physically, wow, physically like, walk wild. around this. Um, That's wild. So sometimes it's terrifying to know that whatever you're working on kind of <laughs> informs a lot. And right. If you start to think about that, you just, you'll just you lock up. <laughs> and you just have to kind of keep going day by day and just task by task because if you kind of think about the possibilities of where it's going to go it'll it'll uh, it'll blow your mind so there's kind of a close up of how these kind of tie fighters would kind of s drop down you jump into it and another one would kind of drop down as well more hallways so <laughs> so many hallways and this is a this is a photo of one of our sets from uh, Rise of Skywalker, one of the very few things I could actually show because we actually see it um, see it in one of the trailers. But oh, cool. you could see those kind of big um, diagonal um, shapes. And we would build, each wall was a three foot by six foot um, block. And we can arrange those blocks in any kind of arrangement we wanted depending on where we were on a ship. So we can rearrange all those little blocks in a different arrangement and create almost a whole new hallway. Or we can wow. flip them upside down and again, kind of create almost a mirrored hallway off of that. <laughs> so how, uh, how many of these physical hallways were built? Um, f well, for, for Force Awakens, we had a lot of them only in that we had this Starkiller base that they all run around in. But we also had these Star Destroyer hallways and we kind of, that's where we would flip one upside down to be the Star Destroyer hallway. And we'd, we would use the reverse of that for the Star Killer base. Um, and there was a lot of uh, Ray kind of running around these hallways to try to get back to her friends. So we had to be, we had to be really creative in creating new um, and fresh ways to put this. It's almost like a, like a jigsaw puzzle of finding new ways to kind of create it. But we... For Force Awakens, we had um, we had a whole stage of just hallways, and I think we did the same for for Rise of Skywalker. Wow, I mean, visual effects obviously improves every year, and what we can do from a from a computer, but still practical uh, sets um, are important for the actors to have something environmentally to put them in, and has yeah. a different look and feel. Well, and, and for, for J.J. Or, or Ryan Johnson, um, they, part, of, part of the look and feel of, those, of Star Wars in particular are the real sets, are the, the physicality behind it. Even though we'll do up to 2,000 visual effects shots um, in a single movie, they want to they wanna have a foundation for, um, for that visual effects, whether it's a real set or it's just a real location that we go out right. to uh, Abu Dhabi and shoot it as a as a Jakku, um, you know, landscape. We may plop a huge crash star destroyer in there, but if we were to kind of build that whole world up from scratch, um, we're having to do a lot more convincing to the audience that this is a real place. If that makes any sense. So, how many physical locations did you have to go to for shooting on? Rise of Skywalker, do you recall? Oh, I, I couldn't recall, and, I, and even if I could, I don't know if I could say. Okay. But, um, but there, were, there were quite a few, more than, you would, more than you would think. Wow. But yeah, the, um, the impetus for, for um, using those real locations was George went out to Tunisia, or he went out to um, you know, the forests up in uh, Northern California to shoot those right. locations. And, um, that just helps us kind of build those worlds out. Um, I think the, the, the charm of Star Wars is that a lot of the world is very grounded, um, whether it's Endor, it's, it literally is just a forest um, shot in Northern California, but then you put a bunch of stormtroopers, you put Ewoks in there, <laughs> you juxtapose all that stuff together and it balances itself out, whereas if it was a completely made up world with you know super exotic made up things it it might not look it may look great but it might not feel 
like Star Wars, going back right. to that kind of emotional hook to everything? Um, I think we should probably look at taking some questions. That's all the slides I have. Okay, so, cool. Um, all right. Well, we made it through. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, if you guys have any questions, please. Yeah, are the horses in the new movie real? Oh, gosh. Did you have to ask about the <laughs> Rise of Skywalker? <laughs> you can ask a Galaxy Quest question. <laughs> um, Galaxy Quest. Uh, honestly, I don't know if I can go into that. Uh, I wish I could. Um, yeah, th those things are are wonderful. I, I can't wait for you guys to see them because um, I, I want one. I want to be uh, saddled to that thing riding around my backyard. But uh, <laughs> as far as how we accomplish that, I think you're going to have to wait to the making of for sure, which will answer all your questions. <laughs> that it? Oh, yeah, right up front. Um, so you're obviously building a few ships uh, and obviously all your creature models and stuff like that, and you've talked a lot about texture. Um, mm -hmm. When you're going into dealing with uh, your paint on your characters or on your ships, because you're battling with sheen and all this stuff that goes along with digital with color, are you guys usually relying on um, color to correct everything later on to get the digital assets to match the physical? Like, do you assume that your physical assets are going to lose their real world color and you're just, and you dial in the texture as much as possible? Or are they pulling their color from your physical assets so paint selection is super important? Yeah, I think it's definitely the latter. For, for the X-Wing, for example, um, we will have paint samples of every square inch of that ship, essentially, in, in a couple different lighting configurations. Um, and then we can take all that information and bring that in to our paint artist that will paint the, the CG um, element. We do have a lot of CG assets that are just made up in post-production that aren't part of the, um, the physical shoot where we'll, we'll rely on real photography for all that paint work. But um, when it comes to like an X-Wing where it's, yeah, it's, it's an actual prop, um, they will scan all of that. They use this photogrammetry camera that will scan an object and all that information can be brought back to ILM. Um, and that goes with color as well. well. We'll photograph every little last bit of them and make sure that we, um, that we tone that in. Now, with that said, it, if something doesn't look right in a shot, we're, we're constantly tweaking that to kind of make it read in the shot, depending on the time of day or whatever world that we're placing some of those elements in. Uh, so we'll have like what I, I showed you, that turntable of the, the X-Wing. That was kind of our general space lighting configuration. But we'll have other worlds. If that ship shows up in five different worlds in our movie, we'll have um, an HDRI of, of, of that world um, to see how that lighting affects each, each scenario. So we'll have turntables of every single environment, which can be kind of um, complicated, but uh, it's something we just have to track every time. But in, at the end of the day, sometimes we're just like, that looks too orange or that looks too bright. Let's just tone down the paint there and, and, and you know, make sure that it fits in the shot. Uh, can you talk a little bit about lightsaber design and how that sort of changed in the in the new movies? Uh, yeah, I mean that again. That's a great. Um, it, it was a great problem to try to solve. Of like, how far do we go with the lightsaber design, and how much do we how much do we retain from the old look? I would say that the biggest thing is we actually built an interactive lightsaber uh, kit. So the actors would use, um, and they were typically like a soft plastic because they, they hit each other over the face. <laughs> you, don't, you don't want that happening to Adam <laughs> Driver's pretty face. But um, <laughs> they would use that lighting information uh, interactively in our shots. And if you go back to the original trilogy, there's no interactive light bouncing off of Darth Vader or, or um, Obi-Wan Kenobi. They, that was all put in post-production. So we had to make a creative decision, do we do all that interactive light um, in these new movies? And I, I think it really is something that was, was the right choice. As, as far as the design, like Kylo's lightsaber, 
Um, a lot of it came from J.J. Abrams. He wanted something erratic. He wanted something a little more dangerous and, and kind of terrifying. So that kind of frequency that's kicking off was something that uh, I believe J.J. came up with himself. Uh, when working with J.J. Abrams and then Ryan Johnson and then back to J.J. Abrams, did you feel that you already knew what he kind of wanted for this new film? Um, it, well, each, each film is a whole new challenge. Each, each one is, um, in a way, we, we have all these tools that we've accrued over time, but in another way, starting a new film is kind of like starting over again. So um, with, I've worked with JJ a couple times on some of the other Star Trek movies. Um, I think the approach is just a little different each time, but, um, but Ryan's approach was a little different than JJ's. That, the hope from like the art director standpoint is that we're kind of um, we're kind of keeping a standard throughout that all three movies look like they were kind of created at the same time. Um, that continuity is is kind of super important, and it, it's important both to us and it's important to the directors as well. How do you decide, like for example, the the X-wing fly across the water? How do you decide whether to use a practical model or a CGI model? There's been a lot of discussion of like uh, every Star Wars movie that we've started since 2013, a director has said, can we just do a real model in this shot? And we always say yes, because we never want to say no. But then we kind of look at how much, what, what it takes to build a CG model versus a, 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 you know, a miniature. And it's quite time consuming to build a miniature and to shoot that miniature. And then it's Creatively, it's constraining because inevitably somebody's going to want to shoot it a little differently or put it in a different environment or change it along the way. So, um, but I will say in Rise of Skywalker, there is something, I can't say what it is, but there is a, a miniature shoot somewhere in the movie. And again, you'll have to just <laughs> wait till they find, figure it out on the internet <laughs> or you have to wait until the, the DVD release. But. <laughs> But yes, the, the, the desire is to always kind of shoot practically. But. Uh, and I will say, sorry, I'll, I'll get to you, but on Rise of Skywalker, we did some fun from a just kind of creative standpoint. I always love the, do you guys know what a cloud tank is? Like from um, a poltergeist or a, even Raiders of the Lost Ark, they'll do this kind of cloud effect that kind of, kind of seeps over um, some of the shots. Um, it's really kind of just, building this big tank and they'll, they'll fill half, the, the lower half of the tank is filled as a certain salinity and the top is another certain salinity of, of salt versus water. And if you drop um, like uh, a dye into it or milk or something, it'll create a layer and it'll almost create this like strata of cloud. And we did some testing just in my garage with that um, without saying anything to anybody, and we kind of showed JJ a few weeks later, and he just loved that we were working on this, you know, God knows how much this movie cost in the end, kind of <laughs> production, <laughs> and that we're just kind of in a garage, just creatively playing with, uh, with a $10 aquarium and borrowing and little, doing little tests. So we're always, you know, so much of our work is done in a computer these days. We're trying to find solutions that uh, creative solutions that are practical that we can then inform what we do later. Um, yeah. So, what went into the decision for the throne room in The Last Jedi? Because it was just such a stark contrast to like, everything that was going on up until that point. In terms of like the, 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 the look of it. The big like red blocks as opposed to like windows as opposed to. Yeah, that, that came from Ryan's desire to want to show, he wanted to reveal what was behind something, but he didn't want to reveal it right away. So we, we did this kind of red curtain, and during that battle uh, between, or, or with Rey and Kylo against those centurions, that, that veil is removed through the use of fire and kind of opens it up into another thing. Um, Ryan was very specific of wanting to be, show something very kind of simple and stark and then opening it up into this whole other world um, as, as the scene progressed. Um, and we just, we just kind of 
went went to town with like this very simple backdrop. It kind of reminded me of the Red Room in, in uh, Twin Peaks um, a little bit. <laughs> and maybe that was the origin of it, who knows. But yeah, that, that was all in Ryan's head from the get-go. Well, that's all we have time for. But uh, please say a big thank you to James for coming out tonight.